was a young priest, uh, only about two years ordained, my bishop in the Diocese of Wichita, where I was ordained in Kansas, Bishop Eugene Gerber, a Catholic opposed, appointed me as the director of the pro-life office. In addition to my first priestly assignment in the local parish in the local vicar, um, and I had gone to a couple of pro-life conferences when I was in seminary, but I have to confess that I had not really been that involved in the pro-life movement. I kind of followed it from afar and believed in it. You know, as a convert to Catholic faith, I mean, I believed that what the church taught about the dignity of life was true. But about the time I received this new appointment, the national um, pro-life movement Operation Rescue was just beginning. And for those of you unfamiliar with Operation Rescue, this was a grassroots movement that sprung up in the late 80s, comprised of Catholics and Protestants. It was a real ecumenical movement that would gather people in front of the local abortion clinics who would then prayerfully and peacefully lay their bodies down in front of the entrances to these abortion clinics effectively blocking entry into these facilities. This nonviolent demonstration of civil disobedience was patterned after many of the nationwide demonstrations during the civil rights movement in the 1960s. And the goal of Operation Rescue was to save babies and spare women the trauma of abortion. These demonstrations would effectively close the abortion clinic down, allowing enough time for sidewalk counselors to provide alternatives to women and their babies who showed up at the clinic for their scheduled appointments that day. Once the police arrived at the clinic site, they would begin removing people one by one who were instructed to remain limp forcing the police officers to carry the demonstrators to the paddy, paddy wagons. The protesters would remain limp, and because the demonstrations would usually draw upwards of 100 people, it would take most of the day to remove all the individuals. Planned Parenthood's own research wing, the Allen Guttmacher Institute, reports that if a woman has to reschedule her abortion, there's more than a 50% chance that she'll decide to carry her child to term. With the permission of my bishop, I became very involved in Operation Rescue and was arrested on many occasions. Yes?
And I believe that. I believe that they would see it, but I would never see it. I was wrong. We all know that this summer, on June 24, not only did we celebrate on the liturgical calendar the solemnity of the Sacred Heart of Jesus and the Feast of the Nativity of St. John the Baptist, who left in his mother's womb in the presence of Christ, but also we witnessed five baptized Catholics on the U.S. Supreme Court issue Dobbs versus Jackson Women's Health, which overturned Roe versus Wade and returned to state legislatures the legal battle for life freedom. How about that for the past moment? And as Jamie said, while we have much to celebrate in this historic moment, tonight is certainly a night of celebration. That's why the bar is still open and will be open. <laughs> we also should not fool ourselves. The road ahead is arduous and daunting. And in the words of Father Richard John Newhouse, in perhaps the most famous pro-life speech in the entire movement back in 2008, quote, it has been a long journey and there are still miles and miles to go. Those words are still true today. For nearly 50 years, Roe versus Wade took the lives of over 60 million American babies and caused psychological, physical, emotional, and spiritual trauma to so many more moms and dads. But the damage does not end there. Roe also damaged the very soul of our country that comment by the police officer that arrested me. Father, something's terribly wrong in our country. During the years of Roe's reign, millions upon millions of Americans have been miseducated and ill-informed about the sacred and inviolable dignity of the human person. And though Roe has been rendered dead in the law, it continues to have significant influence in the hearts and minds of many across this state and this nation. But this challenge should not discourage us. As Father Newhouse reminded those pro-lifers gathered in 2008, quote, we are the stronger because we are unburdened by delusions. We know that in a sinful world, far short of the promised kingdom of God, there is, there will always be great evils. The principalities and powers will continue to rage, but they will not prevail. End of point. Instead, we each find ourselves something like the hero Frodo in The Lord of the Rings. We are being called along the way for an adventure and a journey. We are called out of the creature comforts of our homes and livelihoods for a greater and more noble mission. This mission is, of course, living out the gospel of life, which our Lord Jesus Christ has so perfectly presented to us. It is a mission that entails suffering and sacrifice, but it is a mission that ends in complete victory and eternal happiness. We were made for these very times. The road ahead of us is why this year's conference draws our attention once again to Christ himself with the scriptural theme and the word became flesh. When our Lord became man, he shared the good news in word and action. He met sinners where they were and knew how to communicate to their hearts and minds for conversion. All of us, but especially the laity, as they go out into the day-to-day -day world, must be equipped to imitate Christ more perfectly to meet the challenge of this cultural moment. We live in a digital age that also finds itself in a post-Christian era. And while Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever, 
The truths and methods of yesterday need to be transformed in order to reach the hearts and minds of today's audience so that we can bring souls to that saving message which lives on forever. The hopeful prayer of the bishops and the staff of the Nebraska Catholic Conference is that this weekend will encourage contemporary, data-driven, pro-life messaging and media. And in doing so, help each of us become more effective in our pro-life witness to a world that so desperately needs Christ. In a special way, I want to welcome you all and thank you for coming to this year's banquet and conference. I want to thank our elected officials and candidates running for public office for being here. Your courage to bear the light of Christ in the public square is truly a light in the darkness. I want to thank the numerous pro-life warriors, as J.D. pointed out, with us tonight. Your witness in the trenches of the movement is the stuff of which saints are made. I want to thank all the moms and dads, the grandmas and the grandpas, who are here with us this evening. Your many hidden sacrifices for your children and grandchildren are a true sign of undying love of Jesus Christ. And last, but certainly not least, I want to thank our religious sisters, especially the Sisters of Life, and our brothers, priests, and bishops in attendance. Your witness and spiritual leadership is a beacon of light burning bright as you lead souls to heaven. All of us together, gather for this year's Bishop's Pro-Life Banquet and Conference. I echo those opening words of Father Newhouse's great speech. This gathering, quote, is partly a reunion of veterans from the battles past and partly a youth rally of those recruited for the battles to come. And that is just what it should be. He goes on, the pro-life movement that began in the 20th century led the foundation for the pro-life movement in the 21st century. We have been at this long, we have been at this a long time, and we are just getting started. All that has been and all that will be is prelude to, an anticipation of, an indomitable hope. All that has been and all that will be is premised upon the promise of our Lord's return in glory. When, as we read in the book of Revelation, he will wipe away every tear, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be sorrow, nor crying, nor pain anymore. For the former things have passed away, and all things will be made new. Brothers and sisters, we are poised at a pivotal moment in the pro life movement. Here in Nebraska, we have an opportunity to make Nebraska a sanctuary state. We have an opportunity as we approach the November elections to elect state leaders who will enact laws on behalf of we the citizens that will make our state a safe haven for unborn children and their mothers. To make Nebraska a state where women are truly loved, cared for, protected, and given everything they need to choose life for themselves and for their babies. Brothers and sisters, let this night be a celebration and tomorrow's formation be just one of the many stepping stones we take in the monumental task ahead of us to build truly a culture of life. And as we make this great pilgrimage of love, I leave you with these memorable words of Father Newhouse that I pray you take to heart. Quote, We shall not weary, we shall not rest, until every unborn child is protected in law and welcomed in life. We shall not weary, we shall not rest, until the elderly who have run life's course are protected against despair and abandonment, protected by the rule of law and the bonds of love. And we shall not worry, we shall not rest, until every young woman who is given the help she needs to recognize the problem of pregnancy as the gift of life. 
and you shall not marry, you shall not marry. As we stand guard at the entrance gates and the exit gates of life, and at every step along the way of life, bearing witness in word and deed to the dignity 